I'm Rocky Hunt. I'm from Umatilla, Florida. Uh, I was involved in an unconscionable scheme to defraud me out of 50% of my equity of my marital residence. Uh, my ex-wife and her then attorney um, changed two sentences in uh, a quick claim deed that was filed some four and a half years prior to the dissolution of marriage, uh, allowing the magistrate and the uh, ratified order of the judge uh, to um, actually bifurcate the issues in the case regarding child support, uh, that from equity um, back in 1991. This bona fide binding contract was filed in the county recorder's office and um, it was just prior to the initial summons and petition for dissolution which incorporated recitals in the quick claim deed that contained a constru constructive trust escrow with a resulting trust trigger, trigger feature which is an activation date which invoked a fiduciary duty uh, of the grantee to the grantor. My wife was allowed to move out of state and basically abscond with the funds and do me, which the court had a chance to sequester uh, under the rules uh, of court, um, Florida statute section 61075 and 077. Um, uh, could have made an evaluation of uh, that marital asset and applied it towards any um, future obligation for child support. This was never done. The uh, enforcement division of the court kept me tied up for over 20 years. Um, I was transferred back on two occasions, one with a, a pro bono uh, attorney provided by uh, the state who failed to follow up and uh, uh, obtain an evidentiary hearing so that I could um, bring this issue before the equity division of the court. I was subsequently transferred back. Enforcement went after me again for years and um, for the last six, seven years, I believe it is, I've been barred from trying to get an evidentiary hearing to get this evidence on the record. I had a forensic accountant do some investigations and he discovered um, not only the financial fraud uh, uh, in relation to my equity, he discovered uh, that my ex-wife perpetrated a fraud upon the central depository clerk of courts utilizing two f fals falsified financial affidavits, which basically stated I owed an arrears of uh, $8,000 was later discovered to be untrue. Now I have this that I can show you. Do you want me to pull this affidavit and show it? <laughs> okay. How close do I need to get? And do I need to knock out this, the social security numbers? Uh, well, I can't talk about it because this is a mechanical demonstration. So much, I mean, I'm not going to narrate it. Sit back. Just okay, sit back, sit back and I'm good? Okay. Next to your okay. Or the other. It's not big enough to where it's showing. Okay. Oh, <laughs> well. You can't read it on the camera. Okay. Are we ready? We're, we've been rolling. I'm okay. sorry. Sure. This is an affidavit for an application for services to the Central Depository Clerk of Courts. When someone uh, uh, needs the services of the state attorney, um, normally they would apply with the Central Depository and um, they would use this financial affidavit, which is a custodial parent arrears uh, affidavit. On this, it actually has a section six stated that the case is a Title IV-D recipient, which was not true in my case. My case is a non-Title IV-D. Subsequent arrearages, she stated uh, $8,000. The second portion of this, affirms the same thing. It has a regarding uh, custodial parent arrearage affidavit of $8,000. It, it identifies the three children, their ages, and so forth, and actually has emancipation dates of each child on this. Attached to this is worksheet B, where it lists the payments that are supposed to identify with the $8,000. In this particular affidavit, there were only two payments listed. One of them is a check, and two subsequent months, the rest are left blank. In relation to that, what's not on the affidavit are actually handwritten receipts that were um, written by my ex-wife for the payment of child support, which invalidates the affidavit because they're not listed. We have a payment here for January 9th, uh, 2nd, I believe, 1992, in the amount of $200, signed by the petitioner. We have uh, subsequent, uh, I think there's seven in all. We have one for $87 on January 16, 1992, signed by the petitioner. 
We have a third one, February 1292, the amount of 377 for the months of January and February 1992. We have the check that is listed in this month and signed on her um, previous employer's um, uh, tight court title insurance um, blank paper. It's for $200. This one actually is listed. We have another one on March 14th and another one subsequently 325 uh, in the amount of 187 and 175 and then a payment of three in September, October, November of $400 each totaling $1,200. And I guess the last one for that year on December 16th, 1992 and the amount of 187. Worksheet B does not contain any of these except for the one I listed as a check in this section right here for the month of um, March, I believe it is, and a subsequent cash payment. This document right here is used by the Clerk of Courts Operation Corp Corporation, is given to the state attorney's office to invoke the jurisdiction of a court. It cannot be used because it's false, falsified, sham, and perjured, and it's under notary seal. The accountant's investigation and findings in several cases uh, uh, where there are financial fraud involved have um, have been invalidated through either the initial application, which may constitute fraud in the procurement of jurisdiction, or payments beyond emancipation event, which the state is declaring as arrearages while using Title IV-D status to receive federal funding under the Title IV-D program. My wife was not entitled to Title IV-D services as she had all of the equity in the home. She never was on a welfare. I have a letter to that effect from the state attorney, and neither state, neither state had paid any subsidy, subs, sub, sub, subsidy uh, on behalf of my children, and I had never abandoned them. As a matter of fact, I pre-planned for this in the antecedent property settlement agreement that I mentioned earlier.